here we go. And uh, we'll post this on our YouTube after the fact. Um, so thanks so much for, for joining us. The, the Urbanist is a Seattle-based online publication and advocacy organization that seeks to uh, examine and influence urban policies. And uh, yeah, please mute yourselves if possible. Um, and I'll uh, do a little intro for Rachel and then I'll we'll give her a, a few minutes to introduce herself. Uh, and the chamber, and, and then we'll kind of dive into questions. So I have some of your questions from the registration form, but feel free to put them in the uh, chat as well. And that's how we'll be moderating it. Um, we're not taking questions directly from the audience. So please put them in the chat. Um, and uh, here at The Urbanist, we believe cities provide unique opportunities for addressing the most difficult problems we face from the climate emergency to the housing affordability crisis to the pedestrian safety crisis. Um, and through our website, we, we strive to identify and seize those opportunities together. We're also looking for volunteers so you can reach out at uh, info at the urbanist.org if you're interested. Um, and we're so pleased to be joined by Rachel Smith of the uh, Seattle Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce. And, and for those who aren't familiar, the, the Seattle uh, Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce is the, is the largest business association in the region. Um, it was founded in 1882 by local business leaders. Uh, the chamber today is an independent organization representing uh, 2,600 companies and a regional workforce of approximately three quarters of a million people. Uh, the chamber is also a policy um, advocate and the only chamber in the area that represents <laughs> business association. Um, so, um, Patrick, can you kind of get on the uh, muting, please? <laughs> um, and uh, thank you. Uh, and <laughs> sorry, I lost my lost my train there. Um, and um, Rachel ha uh, Smith has nearly 15 years of government affairs, policy operations, and advocacy experience, including 13 years serving in the lo in local and regional government. Prior to her chamber role, she served as deputy uh, community executive and chief of staff to the King County Executive uh, Dow Constantine. And she also served as government and community relations officer for Sound Transit and in the administration of former Seattle Mayor Greg Nichols. So her experience runs the gambit from nonprofit uh, and government staffing and board members of various organizations. Um, ton of experience and we're so glad to be joined um, Rachel, feel free to take it away for a few minutes for introduction. Thanks so much, Doug, and uh, so nice to be here with all of you uh, tonight. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of what we're probably going to talk about stuff tonight is stuff that I'm really interested in and excited to have this conversation. Um, Maybe I'll start by just saying a few things that maybe you don't expect from your chamber uh, CEO. So I'm originally from Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I was born and raised. Um, I have a degree in wildlife biology, and I focused on marine mammals and shorebirds. Uh, I even wrote a, a paper on the nest site selection of the western snowy plover, if anybody is ever interested. Um, and I did start my work um, sort of in environmental nonprofits, which really came out of um, my uh, environmental work that I did in college. Um, and that included working at Transportation Choices Coalition, um, a group that I know many of you are familiar with. Uh, now, today, uh, as Doug was saying, I, I like to say that I'm recovering from government after spending time, almost 15 years there. Um, as, as Doug said, started in the administration of then Mayor Greg Nichols, um, went from TCC to there. Um, after Greg didn't win re-election, uh, went over to Sound Transit and worked um, in Joni Earle's shop there for many years and uh you know if i didn't love transit desperately before i lo i loved it even more then and then uh came over to the county uh started as the director of government relations and then moved to chief of staff and then moved to deputy executive and chief of staff and i'm not exactly sure how somehow i didn't lose one of those <laughs> titles and responsibilities but ended up doing both and then along the way i worked a lot on um campaigns. I mean, I think I've probably worked on a dozen transportation campaigns um, from initiatives to ST2, ST3, uh, Move Seattle, um, bus measures, etc. Um, I think the very first transport transit campaign I think I worked on was when Kitsap Transit was trying to pass something 
gosh, this must have been like 2004 or five or something like that. Um, so I've been, been working on transit a long time. And certainly when I got to the county, uh, my uh, you know role expanded really dramatically and started working on everything from public health to um, human services uh, to parks and open space and, and beyond. Um, when I when I sort of look at what I've been able to accomplish in my time here in the region, which has been almost 20 years, um, you know, I've had the opportunity to to sort of lead in my career working on a bunch of things that I think are really important, um, starting with climate change. So when I worked for Greg Nichols, I was the uh, coordinator for the city's Climate Action Now program and did that out of his office. And um, this was at a time when, you know, we were talking about Kyoto and, and doing a, a lot of work and working with Harvard. And um, it was a really exciting time to be working on and making um, strides on climate. Um, also transportation, as I mentioned, uh, you know, including the campaigns and things like that. I also um, worked on things like securing the funding tools and the TOD requirement for the in the 2015 transportation package that led to ST3. Um, you know, working on the electrification of the fleet at Metro and things like that that um, I think are, are are still underway, and I've been excited to have the opportunity to work on those. Um, certainly in the human services space, uh, passing help through housing and the Harborview, Harborview bond uh, that we did last year. Um, and then uh, a lot of other sort of random things. I worked on arts with the passage of the building for equity, which is uh, we did with for culture at the county. Um, and uh, worked on the regional homelessness authority and putting that together. And then of course, uh, right before I left the county, it was all COVID all the time. And I'm really proud of the um, the work that we did on the at, at King County and in the city of Seattle um, that, that led to our COVID response and has kept our community safe. Um, and I would say that in every, every single one of those cases, um, I have worked hand in hand with the business community. And I would say that um, without question, none of these accomplishments would have been possible without working at the business with, with the business community, which is really how I got connected and when was encouraged to throw my hat in the ring at the chamber, I, I said, yes, I will do that. Um, I'm really all about working in coalition, uh, working in common purpose to get stuff done, especially the really big and intractable stuff. Uh, that's the stuff that appeals to me. Um, I'm a transportation junkie, clearly. I'm a true blue regionalist. Um, I believe in it completely. And, you know, I'm a bit of a pragmatist, um, but I'm a pragmatist pragmatist that thinks really big um, and believes that there's really kind of no no problem too big uh, for us to solve if again we're working in coalition and in common purpose and I've really tried to bring that spirit to my work at the chamber been there about a year now and since I've started we've done some great things you know we held you know something like 42 vaccine clinics you know got 18,000 doses in arms and that's just something we stood up because we knew that vaccination was going to be the path out of the pandemic we provided free CPA support for small businesses to apply for pandemic relief dollars. We um, ran the entire business community support structure for the county's implementation of the vaccination mandate for some of our businesses. Um, we've been leading all the coalition work around high-speed rail, including uh, I testified in a congressional committee uh, not too long. Well, I guess it was May, uh, so it's been a, a little while now. Um, but I am just so thrilled to see the $150 million for high-speed rail and the Move Ahead Washington package, which just came out today. Like probably many of you, I'll be testifying on Thursday um, in support of that package. Uh, and, and actually at the chamber, we just launched a new transportation initiative that I'm really excited about and happy to talk a little bit more about that if folks are interested later. Um, and we've also been doing a much deeper dive in terms of our work with BIPOC owned businesses and with the people who work closely with BIPOC owned businesses to really reset our entire economic development function at the chamber, which is a business retention and expansion. And it's uh, we're the ADO for King County to really completely recenter that work and reestablish that work um, with sort of two North stars, if you will. One is supporting BIPOC owned businesses, two is doing our work in that space more regionally, recognizing that South King County is different than East King County, it's different than Seattle and North King County. And uh, we hired somebody who's been on a couple of months now uh, to do that work, and we're really excited about that continuing to get going. 
Um, in terms of our priorities, gosh, there's a lot. And I think um, we kind of break it into three three kind of buckets. So um, one is advocacy. Um, like like you, like you all, we are also advocates. And for us, that means, you know, good old fashioned government relations. It means strategic communications and it means research and policy. Um, certainly, we've been doing a lot of work on homelessness and safety, but affordability is um, the thing we want to have a much more substantial conversation about, um, about what it's going to take. And um, I actually just wrote a, a piece in PSBJ that was like the chamber sort of putting a stake in the ground um, to, to convene a conversation around affordability in the city and in the region. Um, certainly in our advocacy space, equity, our anti-racist commitment, um, and helping build wealth in BIPOC communities. And, you know, we, the business community, are job creators. <laughs> so, you know, that is, that is, yes, we need policy, but we also need to see internal changes within our own businesses to provide more opportunity and mentorship um, and, you know, skills and training uh, for BIPOC individuals, entrepreneurs, and businesses. Um, and then I talked a moment ago about kind of our second lane of execution, which is really around that economic development. And I'm happy to talk more about that if folks are interested as well. And then the third thing is really just being a great membership organization for our businesses. You know, we have uh, most of our business is small business and um, most of them are in Seattle, but we also have about 40% outside of Seattle. And um, now's the time when supports and help and resources and connection is more important than ever, both coming out of the pandemic, but also just as our communities have changed dramatically in the last few years. And, um, you know, businesses create the prosperity that make this region great and um and i mean mostly small businesses and so we need to be um, supporting them in every way that we can so um that's a little bit about me a little bit about um what we've been working on and doug i'll be happy to take questions and have a conversation we've got a nice intimate group here so really um happy to to have some dialogue yeah thank you um that was a really good rundown, and I think I want to talk more about almost everything on that list. Um, so uh, we could start at a number of places, but I guess the sort of topic of the day with, uh, you know, news breaking that uh, the announcement of the the move ahead to Washington, which is the uh, state transportation package. Uh, maybe we could start there. Um, you mentioned that it has uh, 150 million for high speed rail in it. Um, and uh, maybe we could talk about a little bit about that more to start. Um, you know, what uh, does the chamber see in, in high speed rail and um, kind of kind of lay out the vision for, for what would make that a success um, for our region? Absolutely. And uh, luckily, I was briefing the Seattle Times editorial board on this very topic earlier today. So I'm well versed and uh, was really excited to be able to say to them, like, you know, you want to talk about momentum, boy, do we have it today. So that was really great. And I think, you know, for me, it just it it is it almost needs no explanation. It's so obvious why it's being real, but you know fundamentally it is you know high capacity transit investments are the only way that we're going to accommodate our growth. Like period, hard stop. And the transportation you build creates the land use that you live with. And we are already, I think, making a lot of the. Um, long overdue right decisions with how we have been thinking about sound transit and centering around centers and job job centers and residential areas. I also think that we're doing the right thing right now in terms of thinking about the sort of all day network and thinking about transit differently than we have in the past. And I think a necessary component of that is high speed rail. Um, you know, 7% of the flights in and out of SeaTac every day are going to Vancouver and Portland. Um, so, you know, the question is, are people doing that kind of travel every day? Answer is yes. Um, you know, the, the kinds of jobs and opportunities that we have in our region um, really do stretch over that entire corridor. And I think, you know, when you look at places, other parts of the, the world, you look at the Northeast and the reality is, um, they're already all doing that. They've already realized that they are a mega region and they have connected appropriately so that people can seek opportunity there. We are, this is our moment <laughs> to do that. And it is our moment for a lot of regions. reasons. One, I think we have 
really gotten our arms around the fact that we are a mega region and that we we would benefit from the connectivity. Um, two, we have a president that is into this stuff <laughs> and a Congress that is willing to move forward on it as they did with Build Back Better. Um, three, you know, we have leaders and folks like Senator Leas, who, um, you know, again today delivered um, what we know could be the match to that federal dollar. So, so now really is our our moment and. I like to say, you know, when it comes to like major infrastructure projects, you don't want to be first, but you definitely don't want to be last. You want to be somewhere in the middle. And I think that's where we are. There's a lot of learning that we can do from um, other projects, both here in the United States, but also around the world. Um, and I think we're on the cusp of being able to take advantage of not only innovative technologies, but like innovative project delivery and like really think about this differently since it would run over two states and then another province. Um, and so I think, um, but but now is our moment. We've got to get started now because if we don't take advantage of the momentum that is around this right now, it's gonna be another five, 10 or more years before we can really get started. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna dial down my passion uh, meter <laughs> here, but I think, you know, and, and I feel it's, it's, it's the, all those same things are true, but just on a different scale in terms of our light rail uh, expansion. So I think, um, uh, you know, now's the time we're the people. Let's do the thing. I do. I do love the passion. Um, and and uh, there's a lot more in in the in the package than than just that. It's a 16 billion dollar package um, over, spread out over 16 years. Um, and you said you're a, a big supporter of the package. Um, and we'll have more coverage of that tomorrow. And we we did some just quick social media stuff on it today, but um, we'll dig into it a little more tomorrow. Uh, but it, it does have more transit than we've seen um, in years past. It still has some billions of, of highway money. Um, and, um, you know, uh, one of the aspects in it is is free transit for um, kids under uh, 18 years old. Um, so do you think that uh, that transit focus um, is is going to, you know, uh, sort of connect and, um, you know, can can we kind of connect that to our climate goals? And I mean, they're pretty aggressive. And and you think that there's enough in there to get it kind of get it, get it moving? Yeah. So I think um, I mean, you know, we're we're going to hear a lot about what this package is and isn't over the next few days as everybody really digests it. And I think there's an acknowledgement that it is, you know, probably can't be dubbed as a big bipartisan agreement. And I also think it reflects a majority of what we are hearing from stakeholders and constituents. And I think that that's a good thing. And, you know, that is in, as you said, Doug, the, the transit investments, that is in um, the uh, highway dollars being focused on preservation and maintenance primarily. It is on the electrification of the ferry system um, and just helping the ferry system <laughs> generally, which um, is, a, is a thing that needs to happen. And it's and it's an investing in innovation, like in through high speed rail. And I think those are the kinds of things. Um, you also see, you know, equitable investments when we're talking about, you know, bicycle and pedestrian infrastructures. Uh, so I, I think um, I think this has all the makings of a package that can pass and a, a package that can pass um, not being everything to everyone, but being a lot to a lot of people. And that is um, you know, we we haven't been there in a little while. I mean, this is this has been some tough conversations over these last few years, and um, certainly it's not going to stop us from coming back and wanting to do more next session. But I think if we can get this done and set this frame, it can it can drop it can drive the conversation next session um, as we think about future transportation investments. So I'm I'm really optimistic about that. And to your point, Doug, in terms of reaching our climate goals. Um, this this package to me is more oriented to that uh, with with that lens more than any other transportation package that we've seen in a long time. I mean, you could argue that you know the investments, the 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 revenue um, authorizing legislation for Sound Transit in 2015 maybe was the same thing because of the transit investment that came from that. Um, but just as far as the sheer orientation of the the package, I think. Um, I think it's showing that we can do that and, and that can be the direction for transportation investments going forward. So um, I'm, I'm optimistic. And again, I think I bet on Thursday when we have that hearing, you're gonna hear a lot of people saying, 
this includes a lot of the things that are important to me in my community. And of course, everybody's going to ask for more and different on on everything, right? But but again, I think it's got all the makings, perhaps not to be everything to everyone, but to be a lot to a lot of people. And um, is that is that pivot? Uh, I mean, it's not not a complete hundred percent priority. As you said, it's kind of a compromise. Um, but is that pivot away from highway expansion something that the the chamber sort of uh, on board with and you know, obviously it's it's a tricky thing um, to get people to work uh, with the messy reality we have, uh, um, you know, people living all over the place, sometimes hours away from um, where they work. Um, but, you know, is we also have the other climate, you know, goals like we were talking about. So how, how do you kind of balance those? Yeah, you know, for us, it's all about the movement of people and goods. And, you know, we know that we've got the highway space that we have today. We believe we need to preserve it and maintain it so that, you know, trucks can get goods to market so that buses can run on it. <laughs> um, you know, that again, mm -hmm. mobility, goods and services, um, that infrastructure we believe needs to be maintained. And, and, and the capacity for moving people has got to come through transit. And that is why, you know, we have supported sound transit. That is why we're supporting um, high speed rail or, or high speed ground transportation. That is why, um, you know, we want to see the kind of like integration of the system so that it is truly um, seamless for people to be able to go from mode to mode. Uh, so we're all about preserving and maintaining the highway capacity that, that we have to move goods and in particularly in freight corridors and, you know, with connections to ports and um, to farms and things like that. Uh, but the real people moving capacity is in transit. And that is, I think, um, I think that that's, um, you know, that that's kind of a given for a lot of people at this point is, you know, we can't, we can't build highway lanes to solve our congestion. I mean, that's that no place has ever done that successfully. Um, what we can build is capacity to move, you know, tens of thousands of people every hour on transit. Yeah, and let's stay on transportation just a little bit longer. Obviously, we want to get to a lot of other topics, but um, sound transits come up a lot, and rightfully so. That's another thing happening right now with the draft environmental impact statement yeah. happening right now. Uh, Three month comment period we're in the middle of, and and that process sort of you know it sounds kind of dorky, but that's that's really what's on the menu, uh, and we have to then pick. So that's that's our choices. Um, does the chamber have uh, any positions yet on the on that draft in EIS? Um, and uh, or just general thoughts about how how that plan is shaping up. Yeah, so we're we're working on that right now. I think like everybody, we're sort of devouring <laughs> what is there. Um, so no, we don't have sort of like firm positions on things. I think I can say a couple of things though. Um, you know, one, we're glad to see that they're now coming forward with um, options that include tunnels in West Seattle and Ballard as sort of the like some tunnel option in both of those areas as kind of like a representative alignment. That's not the right term um, and it's a more formal term, but you know what I'm saying? Like, so, so there's some of those that are fully affordable in the plan as Sound Transit has laid it out that include those two elements. So while not everybody's gonna agree on like which tunnel is it, are we gonna Goldilocks, the bigger tunnel, the smaller tunnel, it feels good that we have like checked that that is now a, a solid part of the conversations. Um, so now I think, you know, for us, some of the big questions are around downtown. Um, they're around both the stations downtown, but also the construction disruption. And I think we want to deep dive into some of the construction assumptions. Um, you know, I, I, <laughs> I don't know that downtown can be like fully torn up from, you know, First Avenue to Ninth Avenue for 12 years. So, you know, what is that going to look like? Um, and we have to build the right projects too. You know, there's no there's no point in in you know. Yes, agencies have to do mitigation, but if you don't build the right project, then you know it's it's not even worth doing. So we also really um, believe that. I also think you know there's nothing here that says we need to go back to the drawing board. You know, the que the the questions for us now are um, along that alignment. Where are the places that we need to make improvements? Um, you know what parts again of the alignment do we really need to get right because either it's going to drive ridership or it's going to drive TOD opportunities or it's going to drive impacts so like how do we really get that right um you know i think the the two year delay um because of the 1.8 billion dollar shortfall 
um, how, how could we claw some of that back, I think is, a, is, is something that we are thinking about while at the same time potentially needing and wanting some other enhancements or changes to other parts of the station. So that's a math equation that is real <laughs> that may or may not, you know, involve the need for more money. And if so, where does that come from? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of going into a lot of detail here, but I guess just to, to sum that up, like we are excited. It feels like there's momentum. Um, it feels like two key pieces, the sort of tunnel pieces have not been solved, but have been answered a little bit, which feels good. And um, now's the time for all of us to be, you know, rolling up our sleeves and diving, diving in. And the, the chamber, you know, will be doing that work. We'll be convening some other stakeholders to talk to Sound Transit. Um, and Doug, if I can, maybe I'll just mention our transportation initiative. So the four key component parts of that are one, high-speed rail, unsurprisingly, um, two, I-5 and like, what are we doing with that? <laughs> what is the vision for I-5, you know, all the way from, you know, Whatcom County down to the Columbia River crossing. Um, I've met with some folks on that today. There's a, a lot of momentum happening there as well. Um, three is all things sound transit, um, as we just discussed. And four is sort of those other regional priorities that are going to come to be bear, whether that's, again, as I mentioned, electrification of the, the metro fleet or it's climate dollars that are going to be coming our way for various projects or federal dollars. Or, you know, are we going to take uh, Seattle's bus measure and make it regional? Are we going to keep it Seattle? Like all those kinds of conversations um, will we'll be sort of captured in our, our regional bucket there. So. Um, so lots of work. We're really excited to be, you know, diving more deeply into transportation. And it's not just because I am a transportation person. It is because it is what we hear from our members. You know, at the end of the day, um, you know, transportation matters. Moving people and goods matters. Um, matters a great deal to the economic prosperity of our region. And we need to be, you know, we need to be focused on it as a, as a business advocacy organization. Yeah, thank thank you for really digging into that. And 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 one one thing I'll just add quick before we, we maybe pivot away from transportation, which is a topic I, we could probably talk all day about. <laughs> but um, uh, one thing we've highlighted on on our publication is that you know the stations that Sound Transit does have in mind, particularly downtown, are, are pretty deep. Um, does mm -hmm. does that give you pause, or do you feel like they can um, sort of solve some of the historic problems they've had with vertical yeah. conveyances? Um, uh, and and just you know, hopefully the, the time penalty for getting to and from the uh, surface would would not be too significant, but that that could be several minutes of people's day. If, uh, if, yeah, right, 140 totally. feet underground. <laughs> Um, yeah, and uh, so we have not, we don't have a position on that yet, but we are definitely thinking about that and paying attention to that. Also, you know, and I'm like not an engineer at all, so please, you know, don't uh, don't don't pounce on me if I if if people have strong feelings about this. But you know, there, there's always the assumption of the twin bore tunnels, right? Like that is how Sound Transit always does does tunneling, and and I know they've looked at single bore and some of that, but you know, I, I don't understand it enough at this point, and haven't done a deep enough dive at this point to go like, okay, I totally agree with that assumption that it has to be twin bore tunnels, you know, so I, so I think there is, there's a lot of questions about tunneling and I know that some of it has been answered and we're all just seeing, seeing some of those answers and diving into them, but, um, you know, station box, station depth, uh, you know, tunnel boring approach, um, you know, all, all of those things, I think, um, matter a great deal to the ultimate experience that you have using transit. And so again, that's one of those things like we need to get it right. And that means we have to do a little deeper dive than I think, you know, we, that we're all doing right now, now that we have the um, EIS information in front of us. Perfect. Well, uh, maybe we'll move on to a new topic just to spare ourselves from uh, getting <laughs> keep keep going on that one. Uh, but um, I think maybe uh, you know, you came uh, to the chamber uh, was last year, and obviously that's in the middle of a pandemic, and that's been a, a huge issue, as you met, mentioned in your introduction, for um, businesses. And um, you know, uh, talk a little bit more about sort of um, what what's helping businesses. Uh, you know, in, in if businesses are finding opportunities as well. You know, how how do we kind of uh, how is our economy adapting, and what's the chamber kind of finding to to um, advocate and prove in that? Um, yeah, so tons to say there. I mean, I think 
you know, when you just look at, at where we are right now, there are some businesses that because of their business or the because of the way they do business or because of the kind of business they do, they did okay during the pandemic. They did very well during the pandemic. And so, you know, the, those businesses are neither asking for help nor do they need help. And they are great economic drivers. And so that is just a good thing. I think there's a second set of businesses that were necessarily more impacted by the pandemic than others tourism hospitality um you know travel things like that and you know you look at alaska airlines for example our hometown airline i mean they were nearly decimated and um so so those businesses i guess i would say like regardless of whether they're large or small because of the nature of what they do they were significantly more more impacted by the pandemic. And then I think there's sort of all those small businesses that were just impacted deeply by the pandemic just because they are small and they're at the margins and they're, um, you know, they, they, you know they, they, yes, have roots in this community, but, um, you know, they're, they're making payroll every month by doing whatever they do every month and when they haven't been able to do that. So I think in terms of how we've thought about relief and support, we have thought about it in those different buckets. Like, if you've been doing well, you do you, and that's great. And if you need anything, let us know. But like we're assuming you're doing well. If you're in those industries that have been hardest hit, you know, we need sort of un we need unconditional support for those industries, right? It is not about any, I mean, they have been, they literally were not able to do what they did before. Um, and then and then the smaller guys, you know, I think it's been everything from providing masks and providing hand sanitizer. I mean, even just the other day when um, Omicron was spiking, we just sent out, you know, some tests and some masks to tons of our small businesses. It was like, I, I don't know if this is like we can't necessarily give you every test for every employee every day, but at least now you have a stockpile of a few of them, you know, so that you can try to manage either for the families of your employees or for your employees. Um, so, you know, I think it, it's really been providing those basic resources. Certainly, uh, we've been a big conduit of information. And, you know, the way that typically works is, you know, government has, has come to us and said, okay, here's what we're thinking. We then say, all right, well, let us ask our questions. You know, what is the public health reason that we need to make this change, you know, have this mandate, um, uh, refine this protocol? Um, we do some back and forth and some feedback there and then you know it, we say okay we're good now we need the tools and the resources to go and help businesses and you know lately i would say the biggest challenges are um you know just constantly changing uh information i mean people are trying to keep up with like what is the protocol if somebody has COVID at my restaurant but they stayed home and didn't come in like are they supposed to quarantine five days ten days so there has been a lot of confusion so we've been trying to clear some of that up um as i think we're kind of emerging from the pandemic certainly um when it comes to relief, the relief programs provided locally, um, the state, uh, the federal government have been uh, lifesavers for many, many businesses. And uh, there has been a lot of inequity in how those have been uh, reaching businesses. Um, certainly, there's been uh, inequity in terms of BIPOC owned businesses getting access to that relief, um, but also you know, if you didn't have, I mean, that's why we paid for free CPA support. I mean, these things are these things are impossible to, these grants are impossible to fill out, even if you're a CPA, you know, and so, uh, you know, if you're a small company that, that does your own books, you know, how are you got getting your arms around a PPP loan? So, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to in any way, I mean, th this relief has been, I mean, it is how we have made it through the pandemic. It is how so many of our businesses have stayed and kept their doors open, kept their customers safe, kept their employees safe and kept, you know, selling their wares or, or helping their mm -hmm. customers. And I think, you know, for the next pandemic, <laughs> there's a lot to learn in terms of how people gained access um, to that relief. And I think, um, you know, the work that we are all doing and thinking about our, um, how we how we do our work more equitably like that is certainly true about thinking about relief into the future in in one industry that sort of fits in that heavily affected category kind of tourism and and service is uh restaurants and one one thing the city of seattle and some other cities in the region did um was street cafes um sometimes taking parking spaces or other 
other available space nearby and, and just expediting those permits so they could get um you know uh and and dropping some of the fees so that they could they could get set up and have outdoor space for people to comfortably eat um and i believe this uh week we uh the C C seattle city council just looked at you know extending that for a year um is that something the chamber supports and would like to see permanent and and um you know are you hearing from members that they like that idea is there is there worries about how that program yeah we we are hearing that people very much like it <laughs> and that it's really working well for a lot of our businesses i mean and it's so you know one of the things about our business community is like so innovative i mean these guys have figured out how to have people dining in the middle of winter <laughs> in in the city you know outdoors and making it work and i just applaud them so much and you know and it's great for them but it's also great for us to continue to be able to do the things that we love to do so um yeah i'm all for keeping that and you know if, if there are concerns we haven't heard heard them um we, you know we have heard really only that people are excited about this and you know things like um you know spots like designated spots for takeout guys to or gals to stop and pick up um, so that they can do takeout, um, you know, that all that has has seemed to be working. Also, um, you know, if we somehow figured out how to expedite a permit to go from, you know, like six years to six weeks um, during the pandemic, I think we should make sure that we continue to uh, keep in place uh, the, the tools that we use to expedite those permits uh, going forward. Um, you know, it is, um, I think it's a great example of when when it's urgent and important and um you know we we can find a way to make it work and we can really kind of cut that bureaucratic red tape and i want to make sure that we continue to do that as our businesses try to expand and grow um in neighborhoods and in downtown yeah that's a really good point and um that kind of reminds me of the design review program for um housing as well um is the as the chamber um, weighed in on that as well? I know there's some uh, a, sort of a push to to reform the design review pro program, like you said, to be less onerous and time consuming. Um, and and you know they during the pandemic they kind of adapted after sort of a, a freeze um, and went online and 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 kind of streamlined some things. And you know I think there's been mixed reviews, but overall probably um, you know we're very grateful that. That, that we didn't suddenly not have housing in a pipeline during a time when prices are skyrocketing. Um, so any thoughts on that? Yeah, lots of thoughts on that. And I think it, beyond just design review, I mean, I think, you know, and, and when I sort of talked in, in the beginning about affordability, I mean, this is exactly what we're talking about. We need to do really kind of a soup to nuts look at what are cost drivers and and that doesn't mean that we're not going to listen to community and it doesn't mean that we don't need to have a place for real concerns like that th those are real things and we ignore them at our peril and it can also be true that we have made things so complex so time consuming and time is money you know so time consuming and um so laborious that um, it literally is driving up the cost of housing. It is literally making people question whether or not they want to move forward with a project. Um, and, and it's not just design review. I think it's DCI, all, you know, everything that we do there. I think we need to take a look at that. So when we talk about affordability and housing affordability, we mean zoning, yes, but we also mean this regulatory environment Doug, that you're talking about. Um, we also mean you know, looking at parking requirements, looking at, you know, other sort of betterments um, and and asking, you know, like we need to have a more honest trade off conversation. And again, I'm not I'm not here to say I exactly know what that is, but I know that we can do better than we're doing today. And, um, you know, what what if there was a goal that your permit for a new housing project got, you know, got approved in 100 days? Like, what if that was what if that was a goal that was set in the city of Seattle and and rather than saying we can't do that they said how how could we possibly orient all of the pieces to make it so that we could meet that goal um and I just made that up but I think those are the kinds of things that we need to be doing and that we need to be exploring as a community um the thing about affordability is um you know it's a hundred things it's not one thing and and we won't see the impact until we do all hundred of the things. 
Um, so, you know, I, I think, and that's what's hard, you know, like you can't, like just doing design review is not going to all of a sudden bring the cost of housing down by $100,000 per unit, right? It's, it, we've got to do all of those things. And so at the chamber, we're really thinking about, okay, how do we package that up in something that we can get our minds around? How do we actually say, okay, from a policy perspective, what are those five or six big, you know, buckets of things that we could do that could truly drive a change in our housing market. And, you know, that that's that's something we want to talk with folks like your members and you, Doug, about, um, but also others. Um, I just had a call about that today with some of our business community members who are keenly interested in this topic. It's like, how can we define what those things are? Because the other thing is, I think there's plenty of political will to do it. We just need to get organized. We need to acknowledge that it's not a, like, one thing and then wave the mission accomplished banner. It's gonna be, you know, year or two of really hard work, legislative changes and and doing that. But I think I think there's political will to do it. And I'm talking about at the local Seattle level, at the regional King County level, and at the state level with the the bills that are being debated um, right now in the legislature. Well that's a great segue. I was just gonna make that segue. Um, I, I... What, what's the chamber's stance on on some of those bills? I'm thinking most especially of House Bill um, 1782, which the urbanist has been covering. It's the missing middle housing bill that would add four plexes um, within a half mile transit, basically statewide. Um, there are some exemptions for cities that aren't in the Growth Management Act or are under um, 10,000, but uh, uh, 10,000 people. Um, it uh, obviously wouldn't, like you said, solve everything, but it would be a big change from what we have now. Um, which is housing prices going up 20 or 30% in one year, in some cases uh, for, for single fam, family home prices all over the state from Spokane to um, you know, places in the uh, Metro here. Yeah, so we we support the legislation um, totally. We've you know been in conversations since before the you know governor started talking about this. You know, we're talking to legislators um, really regularly. Um, and, you know, we're encouraging them, like we want this bill to pass. So we're encouraging them to reach out to some of the folks that have concerns and have an honest conversation about that so we can get this over the finish line. You know, many, many, many years ago, we had a similar effort like this um, that was around equitable communities and TOD and it didn't pass and it had a ton of momentum. And I don't wanna see that happen again. I think we want to, um, see this bill pass. And um, so I think, you know, having having conversations about some of the concerns are valid. I also don't think we're here for those conversations if they don't have integrity in terms of problem solving and they're just being used as a way to fully create loopholes or kill the bill. Um, we're not here for those conversations, but I think there there is some legitimate discussion to be had. And, you know, I mean, for us, places where I think we could find common cause with others is around displacement and some of the definitions of what we're talking about here. Um, in some ways, if we can get into the specifics, I think we can alleviate some of the concerns, agree to disagree on some of them, but be able to move things forward. So, um, so that's kind of how we're we're approaching the negotiations. And um, but yeah, we want to see a bill pass, and um, I think there's a lot of momentum for that to happen in this session. And I think you know having the governor use his platform to talk about this has been really helpful. It is it has been it has changed the conversation um, in ways that I think are um, sort of profound and how fast it kind of like drove this conversation to up up into the. Um, uh, up to the surface, um, which I think has been really helpful. You know, and, and Doug, you, you know this, I think, you know, when we did our um, most recent polling that we did, uh, the index, our research project, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we see that people are open to density in their neighborhoods. And um, we're gonna do another index um, here pretty soon. And we'll be asking some more questions about that that I think um, will, uh, you know, will, will further, I suspect, um, further demonstrate that voters are open to, to this uh, duplexes, triplexes in their neighborhoods. Yeah, and I would just quickly flag that uh, Sightline commissioned a poll, Sightline Institute, um, mm -hmm. that that found you know similar results where the idea laid out in this this bill polled really well across the state, um, really uh, across almost all demographics. Um, was even kind of split among Republicans. Um, so there's not like a uh, you know strong. Uh, Consistency against it necessarily, but of course, it works out different in local conversations sometimes. But um, 
you know, that's obviously a, a, a major uh, piece of the puzzle. Um, and, um, you know, like you said, there's no silver bullets. So um, is more investment in affordable housing from, from you know, government and, uh, you know, if philanthropy as well, if they're willing to chip in, is that another thing that the chamber is um, supporting in its platform? Yeah, we are. And I think, um, you know, uh, <laughs> we need people who are in the lower economic rungs to be able to afford to rent or buy a home. And we need people who are in the higher economic rooms to be able to afford to buy or rent a home. And right now, like it's a struggle across the board. And you know, the way I think about this, which is just deeply oversimplified, so you'll you'll forgive me for that. But you know, the zero to thirty percent AMI band is a hundred percent government subsidy. Like if you are in zero to thirty percent AMI, you are not making any any money and you need government subsidy and that is permanent supportive housing and things like that and the only way that gets delivered there's no market forces there right like that is government paying for that completely capital operating and services when you get into that 30 to 60 percent ami you know you still need some kind of government subsidy to make that housing affordable either as part of the construction you know subsidy to make it permanently supportive or uh, permanently affordable or through a rental subsidy or voucher or something like that. But there is also kind of a market element to that in that you are, you know, you are, well, I think there's kind of a market element to that as well in terms of the construction, you know, location, et cetera. And then for um, that sort of 60 to 80 or, or 70 to 100 or whatever, you know, I think that needs to be incentivized through, you know, more density, which we just talked about, um, thinking about things like, you know, tax credits and tax ex exemptions and things like that. I think there's policy that we can bring to bear to make the market produce more housing. So to me, if we're just kind of like clear eyed about which levers we need to pull for which thing, um, it makes it, it, it makes it, I think we could do our work more clearly. And part of that is 100% government subsidizing that very, very low income housing that is really more like permanent supportive housing that needs 100% of a subsidy and that kind of middle affordable that needs some kind of subsidy from government. But also um, there's other there's other resources. People do pay rent, um, even if it's uh, significantly reduced rent. So, you know, I... I don't mean to be overly simplistic about it, and I don't think it's especially more complicated than that conceptually. Um, so I think if we can sort of think about that and then figure out, okay, what are the tools and levers for each one of those three things, and then decide as a community, here's how we're going to pull them. I think we can do that, and I think we're getting around that conversation right now. It really does feel like there's energy around it. Um, and a better understanding of the of the forces. And that means I think, you know, we, we will be able to get more done as a community, as a business community with policymakers. Great. Yeah, I, I think it really is, you know, kind of an all of, of the above approach. Um, obviously, one of the flashpoints on that debate has been um, the Jumpstart Seattle um, tax. Um, and, you know, that was a payroll tax. They hit the 700 largest business in Seattle um, raised I think it was 235 million uh, last year, um, and you know it was something that the the chamber um, sued on behalf of its members to try to try to block. And I think there's another suit in in, in progress. Is is uh, you know how do you reconcile that? Is there another funding source out there uh, that would be more amenable? And is, you know something we, people are actually ready to grab because we um, and as an advocate sometimes I, I kind of drives me up the wall when uh, you know. There's always some other source, but then revenue source, but um, you know, then it's not realistic either. So there's just no revenue source. So um, what's a good way to get that money? Yeah, I I hear I hear what you're saying, and I think you know, just to to be really sort of transparent about it, you know, the reason that the chamber filed suit on the payroll tax is because we do believe it's illegal. We believe it is an illegal tax. Um, you know, we we know that the state has the authority to collect the tax. We don't believe that the city that cities have the authority to collect this tax. So, you know. It, it, for us, it is not about whether or not you think the tax is good or pat, bad. We, we believe it's legal. Um, you were right. We um, took it to Superior Court law, so we're now in the Court of Appeals, and and we will, you know, we will learn if it is illegal or not based on the that legal judgment. Um, 
in the coming months. So I think there's sort of that, um, and that is separate and, and apart from sort of taxes more generally. Um, you know, taxes are not inherently bad. <laughs> you know, the chamber has endorsed most tax initiatives that that come our way historically I, I can't think of one in recent memory that the chamber did not endorse and support um, and and taxes are not inherently bad because they pay for the things that we value our parks and our schools and our libraries um, also I think taxes are also not inherently good um, you know just because you're taxing someone who has wealth or a company that has wealth um, or an individual it, it does not immediately equate into a public good you actually have to have a plan to do that public good and so you know again totally separate from the question of legality um, I think still think there's a part there's a, a conversation we need to have in our community when we're talking about tax increases it's like how does this meet a community priority um, and uh, we're all here for a conversation about what we want to deliver in our community and how we want to fund it. Um, and I would even go so far as to say there may be worth a conversation around the fact that priorities might have even changed since the jumpstart tax was even passed in the first place. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, I've spent almost 15 years in government and um, they were definitely not all good financial years. And I say that because, um, most of the time budgeting is about prioritization and that has to be a community conversation we have to be saying what are our priorities and how do we want to fund them and how do we want to uh and, and what are the most important things like to me budgeting is not do everything that you've ever done exactly the same way that you've done it and then add to it <laughs> right we've got to constantly be relooking at that and and that's not like a government efficiency message per se it is about a it's a community prioritization um, uh, conversation. And again, I think, you know, for, for me, the operative verb is not collecting taxes or spending money. It's building transit, operating parks, housing homeless. So um, what's the community conversation about that? And then how do we want to fund it? And, you know, the, the chamber is always here for those conversations. And we, we have opinions about what should be prioritized as well. And certainly, you know, right now, as we think about priorities, um, and I think this is also reflected in the the index um, research that we did. You know, homelessness continues to be a top priority. Um, public safety continues to be a top priority, and affordability <laughs> continues to be a top priority. When we ask the question in the index of Have you considered moving out of Seattle, and if so, why? Those three reasons were the top three reasons: affordability, homelessness, and public safety. So, um, as we think about where we want the the city of Seattle to be emphasizing um, their work and efforts and, and resources. It is it is in those three areas. Yeah, and that, that's another good uh, uh, topic to definitely get into. And, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to try to be efficient. But um, let's let's talk. Okay, I'll be um, <laughs> no, you're doing great. I just got I got to sharpen these questions. Um, and uh, public safety is obviously a huge issue, like and definitely an issue that was really big in this election. Um, in, in Mayor Harrell rolled out a uh, hotspot policing uh, kind of uh, plan, sketch of a plan um, this week. And is, is that is that um, some of the uh, approach that you think that will be effective in, in dealing with this? Uh, and, and what does the chamber kind of see as the, uh, the, the solution here? Yeah, so, you know, again, you're absolutely right. Complex complexity uh, needs complexity of solutions, you know, complexity of a problem needs complexity of solutions. So, you know, we we really believe that one, we need to see police reforms. Two, we need to see significant investment in alternatives. And that's a that's a process. You know, we've got to actually figure out what are the right alternatives for this community in in terms of crisis response. And uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Monisha Harrell often is like. You've got police, you've got fire, and then there needs to be a third thing, and we haven't defined what that third thing is yet. And, and I think, you know, we, we generally agree with that. There need to be stronger alternatives. And, you know, the city has um, stepped up with Health One and with the new triage investments. Um, and I think there's still more work to do in, in that space significantly. And then we do believe there needs to be the right number of officers, whatever that is, you know, we are not the experts in that, um, but the right number of sworn officers to make sure that people stay safe. You know, when you 
need a police ma man or woman to come, like they need to come and they need to come at a response time that is reasonable if you're having a serious, you know, violent emergency. And so um, for us, it is an all of the above approach um, in terms of how we work on public safety. Um, to, to your question about um, kind of like downtown focus and hotspots, yeah, we, we do believe that there needs to be some focus there. I mean, we know that there are, you know, some individuals in our community that are, you know, repeatedly um, having interactions with the criminal legal system that are really negative. We got to stop that cycle somehow. And I think, you know, there is um, there is a need for coordination, I think, between our, you know, uh, SPD, between, you know, the King County Detention Facility, between the King County Prosecuting Attorney, between the, um, the Seattle City Attorney, between the you know intervention and diversion providers, between the trusted community providers, um, to to kind of get down almost to the individual level and say what can we do to come in and stop this cycle of negative interactions with the criminal legal system, and that looks differently in different ways. I mean, there is there is organized retail theft happening in downtown Seattle. And that has nothing to do with a homeless person that is in a tent, you know, two miles away. And we, we sort of can't mix that all up. We've got to focus on those things in, in, in different ways. But um, I'm rambling a little bit here, but I think, you know, the bottom line is uh, with public safety, it, it is an all of the above approach um, in, in terms of what we think is needed. And the other truth is, you know, people need to feel safe. And you know, showing them the data doesn't make them feel safe. People need to be able to come downtown and feel safe. So they bring their families downtown. So they want to come back to work. So they want to go to the arts organizations, to the restaurants. Um, you know, people have choices, and we want them to choose to come to downtown Seattle because it's a place they want to be. Um, and so there's a lot of policy work to do, and there's got to be a feeling that it's a good place for them to bring their families. And um, is your feeling that the, the city should be um, sending up these alternatives as, as quickly as possible? Is it sort of a, a matter of, of, you know, taking it uh, strategic and keeping sort of, you know, SPDs um, uh, kind of keeping that the focus as far as, because obviously, as you said, there's a, there's a finite budget and you kind of have to prioritize. How do, you, how do you kind of deal with that prioritization in the short term? Yeah, you know, it's it's a tough question. I mean, I, yes, I think they should be standing up alternatives as quickly as possible, and they have to work, and they have to be sustainable, and they have to, um, you know, it is, we've, we've been standing up a regional homelessness authority for the last, I don't know how many years, like from the day that the the mayor of Seattle and the county executive signed an MOU to say, let's let's address homelessness differently. I think that was in 2000, I don't know, like 17 or 18 or something like that. And we've been standing up that authority ever since. And just a matter of weeks ago, they took on the contracts for the very first time from the city and the county um, with the service providers. And I would say we did that as quickly as possible. <laughs> um, and, and I think it was the right thing to do. We set up that authority because the system was fractured and broken fundamentally. And so we brought a fundamental fix to it and it, it takes some time. So I guess I would say, yes, I think it needs to happen as quickly as possible. And I think we have to recognize that um, sometimes to really truly change the system, you have to take some time to, to do that. Um, you know, what, what we don't want is to, from my perspective, what we don't want is to just kind of like spitball something together and say, look, that, that seems like it'll work. And then we find ourselves in a worse position because we didn't take the time to actually make the fundamental, the institutional change that we need to make in terms of the service provision, right? Because that is what government does. It provides services and they have to work for people. And obviously one of the tricky things is, um, you know, SPD is sort of struggling to to retain officers, uh, and and you know the mayor Mayor Durkin 
now handing off to to, to Mayor Harrell, um, you know, had a had a plan to hire as I think as many as they could really feasibly could with the the constraints they have as far as uh, classroom space and all of that to to train up the new officers. Like, how far can they sort of take? Uh, you know, uh, doing the same things they're doing, still shrinking response times, doing hotspot policing that sort of is a strategy that's been attempted, you know, many times under, whether that's under Mayor Murray or um, I think believe on Mer on, under Nichols and previous mayors as well, you know, how, um, how, how, how far can we pull that lever when we have, you know, a sort of a finite amount of officers and not an ability to, to change that very quickly? Well, and I'm getting a little bit out of my depth here. So I, mean, yeah. on public safety, I'm, I am not an, I, I cannot speak quite as seamlessly on public safety as I can on transportation. But, you know, I, I guess the, the short answer to the question from my perspective is that um, I, I don't know what that, where that dial is or where that tipping point is or something like that. But, um, but I think you, you have to do both. We have to keep people safe and address the issues that are that are most challenging for our community, and we have to make the fundamental and institutional change. And you know, maybe that takes more resources in the short term so that it can take less in the long term. Um, but uh, I just I I don't think that it can be um, an, an either or situation, and um, and I think that's just where that's just where it has to be. Great. Well, we are at 7.30, so maybe we'll squeeze in one last question and let you go. Thank you so much for um, being so generous with your time. Uh, let me see. I have to I have to prioritize in my list here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Little Bellevue and Seattle rivalry uh, going on. Uh, I know you represent people on both sides of the lake, uh, business on both sides of the lake. So um, uh, do you think that what do you make of this rivalry? Do you think do you think both cities uh, can can I don't know take a chill pill and both realize they can be great uh, without without tearing each other down? Uh, and and uh, you know um, can can Seattle still compete with Bellevue being pretty sure that it's the um, you know going to eat its lunch now or something like that? Yeah, so totally both cities can be great. And, you know, I, I think I think um, the rivalry is a bit overblown, you know, and I talk to my colleagues at the Bellevue Chamber and the Bellevue Downtown Association and my my members who um, are both really active in Bellevue and Seattle all the time. And we're not talking about how to outdo each other. We're talking about how to support each other. And, you know, Bellevue is, is facing a lot of the challenges that Seattle faced many years ago. And, you know, they want to learn and they want to, they want to do it differently and they want to, you know, and, and they want to do it the same in some cases. Right. So there's, there's total opportunity there. Um, and, you know, our general, perspective is if you're staying in the region or you're coming to the region or you're growing in the region, we are happy if you are in the Puget Sound region. Um, what I think is problematic is if a business feels like they have to move out of the community they're in. Like if you if you live in Bellevue and you have a great opportunity to move your warehouse to Auburn, that's awesome. And we think it's great. And that is a regional win. Um, if you're in Bellevue and you feel like for a number of reasons you can no longer do your business in Bellevue, then we've got a problem and we need to talk about what are the policy things that are happening that make you feel that way um, or the environmental issues or whatever. So, um, yeah, so I mean, I think the rivalry is totally overblown. I think um, there's a lot of the two cities from the lake across the lake can can learn from each other i think there's a lot that we can do to support each other and i think the biggest thing about all of this is that you know our our people that live in this community they don't live by city boundaries they don't live by county boundaries you know they live in seattle and work in bellevue they live in renton and they work at boeing in snohomish county you know they live in in federal way and they go to the uh, University of Washington in Tacoma, you know, and, and that is how people live their lives. And so, um, and that's what our regional economy really is. So, so when I think about it, it's like, how can we help the East side solve their transportation problems? Cause they're going to have a lot of them. And how can the East side, you know, talk to us about how they got ahead of, uh, on some zoning issues for affordable housing? Like, how can we do that? And, and Seattle is ahead on a lot of things and, um, and Bellevue's doing a lot of great things too. So, I'm I'm not here for the rivalry. I'm I'm here for the region, and I think we're we're all better for it. 
Awesome. And uh, we did get a question real quick. If you have, um, have it, want to share, um, someone has how they could get involved with the chamber. So if you uh, want to share some uh, website or email or something. Absolutely. Um, SeattleChamber.com. And uh, Doug, also folks, uh, feel free to reach out. You can just go to our website and email the info at uh, Chamber and we'll get it directed to the right person. And um, Doug, I'm, I'm totally fine. If you if anybody wants my contact information, please go ahead and share it with them. We want you to get involved. So um, please do. Great. Well, my email is Doug at the So if anyone has any uh, requests like that, feel free to send them to me. Uh, Thanks so much for your time, Rachel. And uh, we look forward to partnering on some of this stuff in the future. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. It was a pleasure to be here. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.